Yeah, I just I, check I, with the presenter if he's okay with it. I'm okay sharing this publicly. <laughs> yes, that's um. So uh, yeah. Tom Bainham, Reverend Doctor Tom Bainham, was scheduled to present tonight on uh, the importance of the Lord's Prayer and congregational song, but uh, he has deferred until August 10th, and so I said I would step in. So I hastily assembled a presentation this afternoon that I hope will walk us through uh, fairly well the article that I wrote on the Lord's Prayer for a Review and Expositor Journal. Um, let me pull up my, I do have a slideshow. Let's see if I can pull it up. Can y'all see that? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, mm -hmm. And for those of you that don't know, I had the privilege of editing this volume of Review and Expositor, and um, it was neat reaching out and working with different scholars and pulling it together, uh, reading their articles as they came in. Of course, I had to edit them and then send them on to our managing editor. Uh, but I also got to write my own article. And so this is that. And so it's called um, uh, A Political Prayer, Praying the Lord's Prayer in Caesar's Empire. And so I sort of started from the basis uh, of this, this thought that the Lord's Prayer is probably the most common prayer uh, for Christians throughout history, the one that we pray on a weekly or even daily basis for many of us. But most of us, my thought is, tend to think of it in strictly spiritual or religious terms. Uh, and so I'm sort of wondering, are there social and political dimensions to this prayer of Jesus? Um, I pulled out a couple of quotes that I found helpful as I was reflecting on this. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, when he marched with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Selma said in doing so, he was praying with his feet. And so for me, that evoked a political dimension of prayer uh, where you know, prayer is turned into a socio-political act. Uh, and of course, his words evoke those attributed to Frederick Douglass, at least. He said, um, talking about his attempts to escape slavery, he said, I prayed for 20 years, but received no answer until I prayed with my legs, uh, which again is a political and social dimension to prayer. So, so um, the Lord's Prayer is typically understood. And feel free to push back against me, but my assumption is that the Lord's Prayer is typically understood in exclusively religious and spiritual terms, but in the first century, there's no such thing as a separation between church and state. So Jesus' disciples wouldn't have thought of the Lord's Prayer with respect to merely spiritual matters. Um, and so my contention is that when this prayer of Jesus is read and it's in Roman imperial context, it takes on new layers of meaning that are profoundly political it has a significant bearing on how people of faith live under the dominion of empire while seeking to fully realize an alternative vision of God's kingdom and justice on earth. Um, so let's start at the beginning. I think the beginnings are important. The Lord's Prayer begins, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, at least in the New Revised Standard Version. I'm wondering if you can share briefly what does it mean to you uh, when we start this prayer, our Father in heaven, how does that hit you or how do you receive it or what does it mean to you? Anybody want to share just briefly? Well, the hour is pretty important, you know, um, I don't think I thought about that much growing up, but hour means everybody, one's who don't believe, ones who I don't like, ones who are different from me, that I got to I got to acknowledge the hour. That's right. Absolutely. It's not my father in heaven, right? Anybody else? It starts us by centering outside of ourself. <laughs> hmm. I like that. Removes us from the focus of our attention. Ruth it also makes us think that this is a group prayer because it's mm -hmm. our collectively. That's right. Yep. Right. Tom had to bow out arts leading. <laughs> oh, oh, arts leading. <laughs> um, 
You, you know, when I think about how I start my prayers, I often say like creator or most holy one, or maybe even Lord or master or, oh, hey there. <laughs> Who was that masked child? Hey, Erica. <laughs> it's just tight. <laughs> But it, for me, it's significant that Jesus starts his prayer with Father, uh, and part I think partly because it evokes the relational dimension of faith. If God is Father, we're all part of God's family and a divine household of faith. And of course, you all already pointed out it's our Father, not my Father, right? Uh, so there's a sense of inclusion and unity uh, and so forth. There's a Jewish context here uh, that serves as an important background. Um, when God, uh, God frequently in the Hebrew scriptures or Old Testament uh, is depicted as the divine father or parent of the Jewish people. For example, when God speaks to Moses in Exodus early in the book, he's, God says, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. I say to you, let my son go that he may worship me. And you'll see frequently in the Psalms, uh, they refer to the Davidic king as God's son. So whoever rules Israel is depicted as God's son, and thus God is depicted as father. But there's an, an, another important dimension. In the Roman em Empire, the Roman emperor was often depicted as uh, pater patriae, or father of the country, or father of the fatherland. If I had had time, I would have tried to pull an image of like a Roman coin or statue or something that depicted this visually, but there would have been all sorts of propaganda during Jesus's time in which the emperor Caesar was depicted as father. Uh, Augustus was depicted, was the first emperor depicted as father. And so I pulled out one quote from Suetonius for you. Uh, Suetonius writes, uh, may, may it be good and auspicious for you and your house, Caesar Augustus, for in this way, we think to be praying for the lasting good of the, the Resh publica and happiness for it and the Senate, we hail you as father of the fatherland. Uh, and so Caesar Augustus received this, receives this title father and the, thus the entire Roman empire is sort of conceived of as this divine household, right? Where uh, everyone who resides in it, I'll, I'll use we language, even though we didn't live in the Ro Roman empire, but we're sort of all imagined as obedient children to our father in Rome. Make sense? Uh, and so, you know, and align with, uh, with this sort of like father imagery, uh, you think of a father figure perhaps as someone with authority and power, uh, provider, protector. Any, I'm curious, any other images for you evoked by the, the father language? Joellen. Um, I don't know that I have any other images, but the... Um, the whole father image is good if you're in a good family, but if you don't have a father that's, you know, good for you and good to you, uh, it'd be kind of difficult, I think, for people praying uh, to God as the father if they don't really know what that means. Absolutely, sure. And we'll see in just a little bit, Rome was... Uh, insistent on trying to, to um, share propaganda that suggested that the emperor was a good and benevolent father, uh, but that may, uh, may or may not have been true. Um, I do think it's significant that, that uh, this prayer prays to God uh, as father in heaven, where Caesar is our father in Rome. But um, I said this in, in my article, by inviting listeners to pray to God as father, the language of this prayer mimics Roman imperial ideology. It imitates the patriarchal context of the Roman Empire for better, for worse. Uh, dot, dot, dot. Throughout the centuries, of course, Christianity is all too often and unfortunately followed suit with regards to patriarchy. Um, so it, it has that in common with the Roman Empire. Hey, Art. Yeah. Why? 
while you were talking, I had the phrase father to the fatherless pop into my head and I don't remember where I pulled that out of, but is that, that, that for some reason I was feeling like that was also like as father of the fatherland, you are also father to the fatherless, you, you know, kind of, you know, father to orphans and widows. And mm -hmm. I mean, is that, is, am I, it's, you know, am, is that in bound up in all this language the way I feel like it probably is, or am I just making that up? Uh, I don't, know that ex that particular phrase off the top of my head but i did in my article i cited um john dominic crossan uh talking about the ways in which god as father was expected and and fathers in general were expected to look out for the most vulnerable uh in their household uh and so there's you know a hope that uh, emperor's father would look out for those who are most vulnerable and and likewise God. Now, whether that actually happened or not is, of course, another case. But, you know, we see uh, language throughout the Old Testament where God is particularly concerned with looking after widows and orphans and, and strangers and in uh, foreign contexts and so, so forth. Um, I, I feel like we could spend a whole hour on father language alone. It's so fascinating, I think, in con the Roman imperial context. But I'll just say this briefly because it resonates. The, in, the, in the Hebrew scriptures, the first use of paternal language for God is in Exodus 4, when God calls Moses to save God's people from captivity in Egypt. Uh, so God's people are called from enslavement by an imperial power to be children of God. And so I, I suggested that to God, to call God father is not simply a relational word, but also a word of hope. Um, so that's, so I'm going to sort of go line by line through this, but any other questions or comments about God as father, especially in light of this notion that Caesar is also father? That's okay if not. Right. All right. Well, on to this the second line. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if God is the divine father over the entire earth, and Caesar is also the father of the Roman Empire, it begs the question: whose will is going to be done on earth? Whose purposes will ultimately be accomplished on earth? Whose kingdom is going to reign? God's or Rome's? Uh, and so there's plenty of Roman imperial propaganda that suggests that the Roman Empire ruled at the will of the gods and that the emperor was the agent of the gods on the earth. I pulled out just a couple of quotes for you. Uh, here's a, a, a quote attributed to Jupiter, the high god, uh, uh, from Virgil's Aeneid. For these Romans, I have placed neither physical bounds nor temporal limits. I have given them an empire without end. All right, and so suggesting that Jupiter himself gave and established the Romans as the rulers of the entire world. And then Josephus, who's a Roman, uh, not a Roman, a Jewish historian, said during the, the Jewish revolt, it was obvious to him that God was on the Roman side because they ended up winning. And then he even uh, writes in one of his uh, works uh, without God's aid, so vast an empire could never have been built up. So even Josephus uh, sooner or later was convinced that surely that Rome ruled at the will of God, uh, the Jewish God, strangely enough. Okay. Surprisingly. Thankfully, no one today tries to suggest that any of our politicians are divinely ordained to rule. Uh, so this is, this is something restricted entirely to antiquity, right? Okay, good. United States didn't invent Manifest Destiny. We only borrowed it from Rome, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to skip this quote because it's lengthy, but I did pull out this quote that I love. Uh, maybe I'll just read the first line. Emperor Nero, uh, um, words recorded by Seneca, have I of all mortals found favor with heaven and been chosen to serve on earth as vicar of the gods. And so Emperor Nero is imagined as the one, the agent of the gods who enacts God, the, the purposes and the will of the gods on earth. Uh, how do you know what the will, the will of the gods is? 
look at what Emperor Nero is doing. Okay. Uh, so, so Jesus, uh, there's kingdom of God language or kingdom of heaven language throughout the gospels. We might substitute in there empire of God. The Greek word is basileia, uh, could easily be translated kingdom or, or empire. Uh, in fact, Jesus's very first words in the gospel of Mark are the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe in the good news. Uh, language about what God's kingdom uh, language about God's kingdom points to what the world would look like if God's reign were fully realized on earth. John Dominic Crossan says it imagines how the world would be if the biblical God actually sat on an imperial throne down here on earth. Uh, so my question to you is what does or what would God's kingdom look like on earth? Do we get any clues in Jesus's ministry or the New Testament? Everyone has their daily bread. That's a good one. Yes. We're, and, and we're just about to say that and, and another line or two, right? So everyone has enough to eat. That's uh, absolutely. Well, if we look at what Jesus said in Luke when his ministries first started, we, you know, have the oppressed and you know, getting good news and being set, people, prisoners being set free and all kinds of radical um, upheaval in terms of the social order. Right. Good news for the poor. Yeah. Anybody else? What does God's kingdom look like? Joe Ellen, you look like you want to say something. Well, for me, you know, it's an inner kingdom. Um, okay. Uh, within uh, each individual person. Okay. Who um, there's a path to uh, discovering that piece of divinity that's within, and once that you feel like you have a relationship with that inner uh, spiritual nature, then you have the connection to God. Um, and it's sort of like, um, I think of it as um, a loudspeaker, <laughs> God speaking to you through your inner, yeah, your inner voice, your inner um, divine spark. Yeah, so inner realities uh, certainly could also lead to outer, uh, outer realities, perhaps. Um, when I think of God's kingdom, I certainly speak of, um, you know, blessed are the peacemakers. It looks like a world that reflects God's peace, where violence doesn't have the same reign that it does in the first century or the 21st century. I certainly think of where everyone has enough, like including food to eat, but also I'm sort of thinking Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like security and safety and so forth, which I think is conveyed by the next petition, give us this day or daily bread as well. Uh, and also equality, so, and justice, and, you know, so many, so many things that, you know, Williamsburg Baptist Church and Genter Park Baptist Church already care deeply and passionately about. All right, uh, I'll just say briefly, uh, the Roman Empire and their Pax Romana, Roman peace, uh, suggested that they offered the same thing, but a number of scholars have pointed out that it, the Pax Romana was actually a bloody peace. Uh, they had legions that conquered the world and then sustained their reign uh, and occupation of other territories. And so I say that the Pax Romana is a bloody peace that primarily benefited the elites it was enforced by Rome's legions and other tools such as cru crucifixion. So who is going to inaugurate God's kingdom on earth? Is it God alone? I, I think and I fear that that's the, the temptation that many Christians think is that uh, when we pray for God's kingdom to come, we're waiting for God to inaugurate God's will on earth. When really I believe that the Lord's prayer is an invitation to collaborate between humanity and the divine. 
Uh, you may remember two weeks ago um, when David May was sharing, he shared uh, this translation by Clarence Jordan of Kingdom of God as Movement of God. And I love that because it has this sense that we are invited to participate in it, not just to be bystanders. Uh, and Alice Burnett Green had this uh, wonderful quote. She says, the work of this petition includes working with others in society to change unjust systems that keep suffering in place and to work on mending the broken systems that keep hunger, poverty, illness, war, and other evils so thoroughly entrenched in our world. Okay, anything else come to mind for your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? So Art, I've been thinking on the kind of the difference between empire and kingdom, and I don't know what is more appropriate for God. Um, empire is <clears throat> empire to me is it's closer to movement. Empires hmm. expand; they they bring in outside and bring it in and take control of. Um, you know, there's there's an element of colonialism to empire. Um, kingdom is tied to land, so hmm. on one hand. Maybe everything is God's kingdom because God created it. So therefore it is God's kingdom. It cannot expand beyond what exists if it is already God. But at the same time, if it is movement, that is more empire and just, you know, and I'm, I'm trying and, that, and I'm going back and forth on Clarence Jordan's movement of God is in, you know, if this is, if everything is God's, then it is God's kingdom. But if God is expanding to fill everything, then it is then it is movement it is empire and hopefully it is you know getting more in line you know you know colonial language is we you know with good reason because human colonialization is, has caused a lot of damage as has empire you know the the language of father empire you know we we, we read father with human eyes we read empire with human eyes we read kingdom with human eyes and then we're like, well, those have all been horrible, so we don't want to use them to describe God, which is why we spend a lot of time thinking, okay, am I, how, what other language am I going to be using? Um, you know, but, you know, at the same time, you have, you know, is God expand, you know, is God expanding into the world or is God, the world coming closer to God? Hmm. There's a, direction? Yeah, I'm there's playing, a, oh, go ahead. the idea of power mm -hmm. um, and what it means to hold power and and to hold authority. Um, is it something that we use violence to keep people down and under our thumbs, so to speak, the way the Romans were, um, you know, they typically did, especially when they came into a different area or is power something that we use to make things better, hmm. to, to feed people, to care for people, to create those systems that are just, how do we use our power? And I think when you're praying your kingdom come, it fills us in this collaborative effort of sharing that power in ways that are beneficial. I love that. I think that's great. With the, with the kingdom of God, I think of choice. We have a choice, but when I think of empire, I think of somebody above us making decisions for us. Mm. And um, it's not quite as a choice. Mm -hmm. I do think there's a danger that Christians throughout history have fallen into the evils of empire uh, and become um, complicit in colonization, uh, using violence to spread God's kingdom, God's kingdom, but you know, uh, uh, in ways that don't really reflect God's kingdom, right? Good thoughts. Any, anybody else on this kingdom of God language? All right. I'm going to walk us through daily bread and then debts and then, uh, then trust, pat, then uh, temptation. So, all right. Give us this day our daily bread. Just curious briefly what comes to mind for you when you think of daily bread. What are you praying for when you pray for daily bread? Art, you mentioned Maslow earlier and the hierarchy of needs. Um, that to me has always been, when I think of daily bread, I think of at least God give us that base of what we need to exist and live. 
you know, it's not just food, it's, it's shelter. It's, it's a, a reason to be, you know, all those things that are required just to exist. I agree. Cheryl, you said, look like you want to say something. I, I did unmute. Um, I, I think for me, what is, I, I mean, I remember someone saying this, so it's not my original idea, but the fact that it's this day daily, Brent, mm. like that it's, it's not just praying for our needs, but to help us create a trust um, that mm. we can, we can trust God to provide for us each day. Um, and that we don't need to, to keep worrying about the what ifs, the what ifs. Um, and it sort of harkens us back to the, uh, the exodus and the, the manna that came each day. Um, it wasn't like, you know, that they, and if they hoarded it, it spoiled, you know, <laughs> like that was right. intentional, right? Because it was trying to, to teach them a trust and a daily reliance. And so, um, you know, whenever I pray this, um, I, I, always, I emphasize, you know, give us this day, this day, our daily bread, you know, that that to me is the, is what I'm trying to, to focus on. Let's, let's give us our 401k, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> I don't even want to think about that right now. <laughs> I, I got my June, June statement. It wasn't good. <laughs> um, just thinking about the culture then, uh, they didn't have refrigeration. They didn't, they had to every day <clears throat> process or make, uh, catch their food or in some way cook their food or it, it wasn't something that, <clears throat> They could go to the grocery store and, you know, have already done. It was uh, daily. I mean, it, it seems to me that it's really emphasizing the daily toil and the mm. daily necessity of um, being thankful for mm. that day's bread. Right. Yeah. And um, I'll, I'll mention this in a minute too, but, you know, the vast majority of the population lived, what's the expression, hand to mouth or something? It's not like they had, you know, a pantry where they stocked up for the week or, you know, uh, a 401k, like you said. Uh, so, yeah. So, the for me, the most obvious connection is to this story of manna from heaven in the Exodus, mm -hmm. Exodus chapter 16 where, um, you know, the Israelites uh, start grumbling on their exodus journey through the wilderness, and they start to think, you know, we're hungry, uh, and maybe it would be better if we go back to Egypt and die there, because at least we knew there where our next meal was coming from, uh, and again, we hear these, like, echoes of imperial power and uh, colonization and enslavement. They were slaves to Egypt, uh, a, a great empire. And so, so God ends up giving them daily bread and you're exactly right. They couldn't hoard it. Uh, and, uh, you know, if they collected enough for today and tomorrow, the extra rotted, uh, the, strangely enough, if they didn't connect, collect enough for today, they still had enough. Uh, and so I wrote, um, the Exodus story reveals a divine economy where hoarding is inappropriate and all have enough. Those who gather too much, uh, and I had today in mind, just as much as I had in the ancient world, those who gather too much, whether out of fear or greed or a sense of entitlement, find that their extra manna rots. Uh, those who are unable to gather enough for themselves, whether because they're sick or disabled or otherwise, discover that there is still enough to go around. And so it's, it's fascinating to me to think about in the context of this story. It doesn't matter whether you, you're worthy or not, or you deserve it or not. You don't have to earn your keep. God is going to provide enough for you each day. Uh, of course, within, <laughs> I'm going to keep coming back to Rome because that's what my article is about. I'm going to start sounding like I'm beating a dead horse, I'm afraid, but this is, <laughs> this is I'm a, a scholar of Imperial Rome. So uh, the Roman Empire and its propaganda pr promised uh, and suggested that it was the provider of bread and abundance. I pulled out a couple of quotes. Uh, the first one from uh, the Aeneid, uh, here is Caesar, in truth, he whom you often hear promise, Augustus Caesar, son of a god, who will establish a golden age in Rome. 
Uh, so this notion that with the advent of um, the Roman Empire and Caesar Augustus, uh, the gods established an era of surplus and abundance for all. Uh, and then I pulled out this one quote from Horace, uh, who says, bountiful in crops and cattle may Mother Earth deck Ceres, who's the goddess of agriculture, corn and harvest, uh, with a crown of corn and may Jove's wholesome rains and breeze give increase to the harvest. Uh, and so once again, there's this um, sentiment, whereas the agent of the gods on the earth, the Roman emperor is going to channel the divine blessings into a surplus of food and drink for all. Uh, there's this message that Roman rule is good for everyone. Now, the reality on the ground was that most folks lived at or near subsistence level. They were living hand to mouth or one bad harvest uh, or one um, uh, poor poor year, uh, you know, they, they would fall below subsistence level and they would struggle to meet their basic caloric needs. Uh, sickness and disease were rampant, of course. And so to pray for daily bread is not merely a request for God to meet one's spiritual needs. Rather, it was a sincere request for God to provide enough literal food to eat because those who first heard and prayed the words of this prayer wouldn't have been able to take this for granted. Uh, and Jesus's own ministry sees, t uh, demonstrates this concern. Uh, over and over again, we see Jesus feeding people, right? Uh, feeding the multitudes, uh, sitting at table fellowship, especially with folks who uh, might not have been expected to be at the, the table. So there's, in my mind, a, a tension between this question of who really is the true source of providence and food for all. Is it Rome, the empire, Amazon.com and their lovely Prime Day sales, or is it Jesus and God in heaven? <laughs> I just. All I can say is that it's the creation. So, what's the source of the creation? Great, great question. Yeah. This one keeps bringing me back to Cheryl's idea of trust because mm. i i hear this phrase very differently the last couple of years um since i've had to go gluten-free because bread mm. it makes me absolutely miserable mm. um and it's more of give me this day what i need for today because this day what my need is is probably not what my need is going to be mm. over time mm. my needs are going to change and let me trust that you're going to provide for me with whatever those needs become mm -hmm. in all stages. And there's a certain element of patience with that too. That <laughs> You can't rush that. You have to kind of grow your way each day into that, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. But I'm hoping it's gluten-free bread, even though gluten-free <laughs> bread is nasty. <laughs> You know, I think for me, it's whatever we feel a sense of scarcity about. Like I feel a sense of scarcity about time. Uh, like, how am I going to get it all done? Like be a good parent, be a good pastor, be a good spouse, <laughs> have time to, you know, make a healthy meal or go for a run or something. Uh, and so for me, you know, when I pray this, God, you know, help me realize that I have enough, enough time, enough money, enough food enough love and security and so forth uh yeah chris you're doing an amazing job by the way multitasking we see you <laughs> keep up the good work my hands weren't doing anything so now they're being used so. <laughs> there you go <laughs> let me um tell you just a, a couple of things that i found curious I, back to the, the the singular versus plural language. It's not give me my daily bread. It's give us our daily bread. Basil of Caesarea in the fourth century said, had this fascinating quote, the bread that is spoiling in your house belongs to the hungry. The shoes that are mildewing under your bed belong to those who have none. The clothes stored in your trunk belong to those who are naked. The, poor, the money that depreciates in your treasury maybe now rele more relevant than ever, <laughs> belongs to the poor. Uh, so there's a sense, and when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, those of us who have enough must also commit to sharing so that others have their daily bread too. 
Um, oh, I, just pulling out some fun statistics. Would you believe you probably would, but five out of the 10 states with the highest weekly church attendance are also among the highest poverty rates uh, in the US. I should have made you guess the states, but I've listed them on the slide for you. Uh, food insecurity continues to be a daily reality for many in the US and disproportionately affects persons of color. Uh, one in five, at least as of 2021, one in five black individuals contend with food security. So I can't help but wonder if churches are missing the mark with regard to this pet petition for daily bread. But whereas Imperial Rome or ImperialAmazon.com uh, promises to you know, provide abundance to the masses, in my mind, this petition invites us to see not only God and Jesus, but also followers of Christ as providers of bread. As long as we're in the kingdom, you know, the, as long as we're talking about empire, it, I feel like this is where the the whole Luther, Augustine, two kingdoms thing gives us mm -hmm. a cop out. You know, it, it, yeah. it, it is, it's a it's a cop out. You know, it's like, well, you know, we're responsible for this kingdom and God's, you know, on earth as in heaven. But those are two different kingdoms. And, you know, we'll kind of half half it pass it here. And and uh, but don't worry, there's a whole nother kingdom. You know, you know, we're, we belong to another kingdom and we're that this part only belongs to that kingdom. You know, I, I, when we when we separate ourselves out that way, it creates a level of I don't need to worry about that. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's been some bad, uh, a very unfortunate and bad interpretation throughout church history. Think about the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. I think a lot of Christians have felt like they're let off the hook for making the earth reflect God's kingdom and God's heart for the world. Uh, whereas I would say when Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, he's saying, my kingdom is of a different quality and nature than the kingdoms of this world, one that's not marked by power and violence, but rather love and self-sacrifice and giving and peacemaking and so forth. But that comes down to how is empire spread? Is it spread through the sword or is it spread through, you know, what Jesus did? So, And Christianity has been spread through both throughout history. On, you know, for better and for worse. Yeah, one snaps back a lot harder, though. <laughs> Any other thoughts on daily bread? I think one thing, too, that I, I hear as a danger, because um, I've, I've heard this argument, too, about why government programs for the poor, we shouldn't have them, because individual Christians, we should be feeding the poor, not the government. Um, and so it's an interesting thing when you think about, well, I want my government to be just, I mean, especially if you live in a democracy, the idea that the government is the people, right? I mean, so um, what do we want our government to do? Um, it's not a theocracy, it's not that, you know, but um, but yeah, that we can, but it can, it can work the other way too. I think you can sort of say, oh, well, we have welfare programs, we have social services, I don't need to get involved, the government can take care of it. So like there's a danger in both directions. Um, I think that, um, and you know, when it's policies and things that are actually the oppressor, um, you know, as Christians, I think we do have a responsibility to, to stand up against those kind of policies. Um, so I just throw that out there too. Absolutely, great, yeah, great thoughts. Yeah, to me, it ends up being a that that's that always has to be a yes and situation. <laughs> yes, we are responsible, but yes, we're also responsible for voting for ways to that also do it. You know, there um, I follow on Twitter. Uh, uh, there's a, a a DC mutual aid group that's been trying to take the lead. I guess. Um, the governor of Texas has been shipping all of his uh, refugees to D.C. saying, you know, well, D.C., you all got you, you, you. It's your policies that are letting them come here. So we're going to put them on bus. And literally they are busing immigrant immigrants, you know, with just, just to say refu not even refugees to D.C. and just dumping them on the streets of D.C. And, you know, that they, they, they said, you know, that this the, the um, group said, hey, you know, yes, yes, our government is, is you know, th there is a governmental responsibility for taking care of these these people but also we're just going to cut the red tape and do it ourselves um you know and then they show a picture of what they get you know from the federal government and it's 
It's this pack of essentially what looks like World War II era rations and a box that says, welcome to the United States. Here's your freeze dried food. You know, something that got probably got purchased, you know, on a bulk rate for as much as they could get and then store it in a, and they store it for years until they could use it for these folks. So, you know, I, I think it's got to be a yes, we are doing this all together as a government. And, and yes, we are showing up for these people when they are needed. Um, and we, should, you know, we can all probably do more. Right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Government and churches both seem to be dropping the ball in some ways. All right. Uh, let's see. All right. So forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. I'm, I'm curious, uh, what are you more used to saying, debts or trespasses? Will you raise your hand if you grew up saying debts? Forgive us our debts. Okay. How about trespasses? Okay. Uh, it was only when I got to seminary at a Presbyterian school that I, that I first heard people pray this as debts rather than trespasses. Uh, you know, and in, in my mind, they, they interpret very differently. Debts has a more economic dimension. Trespasses, to me, evokes more sin, sin language. Forgive us our sins uh, as we forgive those who sin against us or wrong against us. Uh, I gave you the translations of Matthew and Luke's versions of this. Uh, Matthew says, forgive us our debts, ophelemata, as we have forgiven our debtors, uh, same root word, uh, very literally like our oughts or the things that we owe in Greek there. Luke 11, NRSV, however, says, forgive us our sins, hamartia. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. Isn't that interesting how Luke and Matthew have different language for the Lord's Prayer here? Um, so debt was a, re a, a reality and a crisis for many in first century Palestine. I list some contributing causes here. The Romans required uh, uh, tributes. There was a temple tax that they had to pay reality of crop failures, the need to feed family and animals, and then save something to plant seeds for next year. Debt enslavement was a reality for many. Uh, debt enslavement would be selling oneself into slavery because of their inability to feed family. You might choose to become enslaved uh, as a way to meet your debts and, uh, and be able to provide for your family. Um, it's interesting, we know that debt was a crisis in first century Palestine, among other reasons, because during the Jewish revolt in the, the second half of the first century, when the Jewish rebels occupied the temple at the beginning of this violent rebellion, the first thing they did was burn the debt records. Isn't that interesting? Uh, so clearly that was on their mind. Uh, and there was also a common belief that the Messiah would inaugurate the Jubilee year and release everyone from debt. So there was clearly a deep desire for debt forgiveness in first century Ju uh, Judaism. Uh, this harkens back to this notion of the Sabbath year or the year of Jubilee, uh, in which um, the Jewish law established an ideal uh, where every seventh year there would be forgiveness of debts and release of slaves. Exodus 21 is just one place that draws this out, uh, where slaves shall be freed every seven years without debt. At least Hebrew slaves shall be freed. Uh, and, uh, but the reality in the first century is, is that there are ways to avoid forgiving debts. Uh, if you're a wealthy elite, uh, you could find ways to avoid forgiving uh, those who owed you debts. Uh, I'm trying to watch my time and move a little bit quickly through this. I'll just read this. The daily economic realities provide a helpful backdrop for this petition of the Lord's Prayer. Jesus is inviting his followers to pray for the forgiveness of debts in the face of a heavy debt burden in the first century, which is engendered and exacerbated by Roman imperial occupation and taxation. He's doing so in a Jewish context in which the Sabbath year and debt forgiveness represent an ideal vision and yet at a moment in time when there's probably very little actual relief for those suffering under debt's crippling weight. Finally, he's teaching this prayer primarily to peasants who were in all likelihood poor non-elite debtors rather than wealthy elite creditors. Okay. 
so in my mind, uh, it makes a lot of sense to interpret debts as actual economic debts and its original earliest context. Uh, not that it can also be interpreted as forgiveness of sins, but uh, to keep in mind that there are economic dimensions to this as well. Uh, so I say th this petition does three things. One, it is a sincere request for God's intervention in debt, which in the first and 21st centuries alike can often be difficult, if not impossible, to eliminate. Think of, you know, payday lending traps. Once you become indebted or student debt, you know, once you take on that debt, it feels like it is only going to be by a miracle that you're freed from that debt. Uh, two, it serves notice to creditors and reminds them of the burden they impose on others. And three, I suggest it's an, a rhetorical nudge. If you pray, forgive, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, uh, what if you haven't forgiven your debtors and you're, you're praying this prayer? It, it may lead you to wonder, is God going to forgive me if I had, haven't forgiven my debtors? And that way it invites you, if you're a creditor, to consider forgiving your debtors. Mm. Um, so any, any connections or modern parallels that you see to this petition today? Is that still a, an issue? Not really, right? Well, I, you know, I think the hour part again, which is so comforting at the beginning, gets a little challenging because maybe I forgive somebody who owes me money if we're talking about money. But I, like, I personally have been wrestling with this whole thing of student debt. Mm -hmm. And that's an hour thing. That's a, and so, you know, I've gone, how do I feel about that? And how do I feel about, the responsibility that someone takes on willingly, and then I back it up to those for-profit colleges that lure people in. And then I think, well, if we forgive that debt, it's to our benefit to have more people working and not in debt. But at the same time, they who owe money have accepted a responsibility. What does that do if you sign on for something mm -hmm. and then don't carry through. So I think the our part, our debt part hmm. is troubling as well as, you know, if you're talking about money, the national debt, and what do we spend our money on? You know, I might want more social services, and you might want bigger tanks for Ukraine, you know, I, it's the our part is really messy, in my yeah. opinion. <laughs> What does it look like to create a world where all have daily bread and, and thus don't have to take on debt just to eat or just to meet their daily needs? There's a connection. Is, co is college a daily need or is that a, you know, uh, then you get to, it, it, is, is that like healthcare and food or is mm -hmm. that something, if you can do it, you do it and not everybody gets it? That's such a good question. Yeah, it's sticky. Yeah. <laughs> Messy. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, my mind went to, um, you know, the ways in which debt is exploitative. So, you know, I don't have solutions to student debt, but I'm just thinking the ways in which, um, you know, 18 year olds who can't even, you know, buy alcohol yet, whose brain stems aren't fully formed, uh, are saddled with debt that will affect them for decades. Uh, is, is there something exploitative about that or payday lending or credit card traps or, and I even think about like, um, you know, the lottery, which, uh, uh, you know, it tends to exploit folks who have less money and less resources. Um, well, you know, and I think about like my own situation, I, I walked out of college without any debt. Um, and that wasn't really anything I did I mean I, I went to a private school I felt like I went to community college and I had parents that could pay for it I you know mm -hmm. I got a scholarship um because I had a good education you know high high quality school system and and guidance counselors that put me in the right direction I mean so like there's so many things that contributed that were out of my control that mm -hmm. allowed me to go to college 
and actually even seminary um, <laughs> Presbyterians paid for my for my schooling um, you know and that uh, um, you know why why do I get that and somebody else you know has to take loans and things you know so like again that hour is a really uh, messy is a great word Nancy I'm just yeah. I'm really, <laughs> I mean it really is because I um, you know it's there's so many things that I realized that um, you know the privilege and people don't like to use the word privilege advantage um, sure. you know advantages that I have based solely on who my parent who I was born to you know and where I was born um, that if I could be, I could be the exact same person, the same genetics, same whatever, and put in a different place, and my life would be so different. Um, mm. So, look, great, great point. Look at this last quote: uh, "Whereas empires saddle people with debt and slavery for the sake of the wealthy and elite few, the Lord's prayer imagines a divine household in which all have enough." And debts and sins alike are forgiven. And it, it goes back to this radical reordering of the world that's imagined by the kingdom of God, which Jesus is working to inaugurate. All right, one last petition. I'm going to try to sneak through this pretty quickly. Uh, and, and do not bring us into the time of trial or temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Uh, my, again, my, my thought, at least my own experience has been to spiritualize this petition and make it so that it's about the avoidance of personal sin, you know, drinking or swearing, or for us Baptists dancing probably. Right. <laughs> uh, so let me see if I can go through this quickly. There's a, a temptation to wonder if God is really present when the, the Israelites are, are moving through the Exodus journey. Is God with us or not? Will God intervene or not? There's a linguistic connection in the text. Uh, and so Warren Carter says that this temptation derives from God's apparent inactivity and the continuing imperial status quo. It, it you know begs the question, if we are looking for God to establish God's kingdom, why hasn't it happened yet? Why does Egypt or Rome uh, still rule the world to this day? Uh, and so part of this, this prayer is to pray against despair, concluding that uh, the world will never change, that the empire will always win and always be in control. Uh, in that context of violent revolt, against the empire might seem to be a tempting option to institute the kingdom of God. In fact, there were a number of Jewish revolts and violent resistance movements around the time of Jesus. I mentioned a couple that I won't get into depth, but uh, within the gospel of Matthew, the most obvious connection is in uh, the garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus says, pray that you don't come into the time of trial or temptation. The very next thing that happens is the soldiers show up. One of Jesus' disciples draws a sword, lops off ear, and Jesus says, put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. So for me, there's a strong connection between this petition and this temptation to use violence, uh, especially for the inauguration of God's kingdom, okay? Um, and we have seen Christians do that, you know, at various times in church history. Um, so uh let me read this maybe last quote and then i'll pause and see if you'll have any closing thoughts or comments reading and praying the lord's prayer today is political kneeling is political this prayer offers a challenge to live in a way that reflects god's kingdom in this world it is a vision of a world with justice and fairness for all a world in which wealth is not hoarded but rather all have daily bread in which debt is not a crippling burden for anyone and which in which violence no longer holds sway. Let me pause. Thanks for listening. Any questions, comments, uh, lingering thoughts, doubts, hopes, dreams, or fears? So I've always kind of, I, for some reason, I, a lot of time I separate out the lead us not to temptation and deliver us from evil parts. And, and, and maybe that's a mistake, but to me, the deliver us from evil also includes the random acts of violence that just say, God, I don't want to get shot today. Um, you know, it, it, you know, it's, it's deliver us, meaning 
keep me from doing evil, yes, but also mm. can you keep let's keep everybody else too, so this doesn't happen. Um, and uh, and my other thought was um, one thing I'm always trying to keep in mind when I'm praying the Lord's prayers is that I don't always do because you get in the road sometimes, but if you back it up two verses and you, you begin with, don't be like the hypocrites. Um, you know, if you, if you think about the Lord's prayer as the antithesis of the hypocrites, um, you know, as long as, you know, we've got the, the, the kneeling at the kneeling, your mention of kneeling, uh, you know, brought that to mind in the 50, you know, the coach at the 50 yard line and the Supreme court case and all that fun st stuff we have going on right now. Um, you know, but at the same time, what, when do we do this prayer more often than any other time we do it out loud in front of a group of people, mm. you know? So, you know, how often are we doing that? You know, you're like, all right, well, Jesus said, don't do this out loud in front of a group of people, but I'm going to lead you all in doing this out loud in front of a group of people. And we're going to hope for the best. Right. <laughs> Good thoughts. No easy answers. I did, I did talk a little bit more length in my article about, and I can email this to y'all if y'all are interested in, about the evil, you know, deliver us from evil. Just didn't have time to get into it tonight. I say, are, when, are the paper copies of this out now? I mean, I used to always cheat and steal my review and expositor oh, yeah. from BTSR. I know. Yeah, no, I haven't gotten mine in the mail yet. So I, I hear they're coming. So we'll have to figure out a way to get some over to, to, to uh, Ginner Park in Williamsburg for folks to check out the library or whatnot. So Absolutely. Pass it around. Yes. Well, I hope I've convinced you that there were political dimensions to the Lord's Prayer and there are ways in which it's not just spiritual, but uh, calls us to live in uh, particular ways in the actual world. Cheryl, I see you unmuted. I, I was just going to say, I think you did a fabulous job for a pinch hitter here. Uh, so uh, <laughs> kudos and uh, a lot to, a lot of good stuff here. Thank uh, well, you. in a lot in every hour. Um, and it's <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, hope you'll have a wonderful week. Uh, I think Jen McNeil uh, is going to join us next week. Her, she's looking at the context of Matthew and Luke and the ways in which uh, the Lord's Prayer is a tool for teaching folks to pray. Uh, her article was wonderful, and so I'm really excited for her to join us. And she's a great, great teacher, a former PhD um, uh, colleague of mine. We're in the PhD program together, so we'll be excited to welcome her. All right, well, blessings to you all. Thanks so much for your good engagement and conversation and questions and comments. Y'all take care, okay? All right, bye.